Hi everybody, I am William of AEW Studios. Before we start, I wanted to give a brief background um, behind this episode. The other week, uh, I made this episode available to members of the Bricks in Motion Patreon uh, with the intent of releasing it to the public that following Wednesday. Just before we did so, we heard the news that Tony Mines, one half of Spite Your Face, passed away after a battle with terminal cancer that previous weekend. Given the news, we wanted to delay the release of the episode and to give a brief introduction and add some context. Back in May, we had the honour of speaking to both Tony Mites and Tim Dre despite your face. Despite the circumstances, both Tony and Tim were great to talk to and they talk extensively about the process of making the most iconic films and insight into their various inspirations and influences. It is no exaggeration to say that they kickstarted so many people's brick filming journeys and have some of the first brick films that many of us ever saw, myself included. From some of the pioneers of the online community, even to new brick filmers who started uh, in the later days of YouTube. Tony Mines was a true legend of the brick filming community and the LEGO community more broadly, and his legacy will live on for generations to come. And with that, here is the episode. Hello everybody, welcome to the World of Brick Films podcast. I am your host, William of AZW Studios. Joining with me as always is my good friend and co-host, Sean Willis of City Penta. Hello again. And our special guests today are Tony Mines and Tim Drage of Spot Your Face. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, um, we're very, very happy to have you on because since the beginning of the podcast, we've always been talking about your brick films. It, it's, it's kind of a running joke how frequently <laughs> they come up. Um, you know, basically, like everybody saw them as some of the first brick films they ever saw. And I feel like... We always liked the idea of asking you to come on, but, you know, usually we're kind of asking people who we already kind of know in the community. And it sort of feels like from the very beginning of time, you were kind of like on your own track, you know. So I was kind of worried that maybe from your perspective, if we asked you, you might be thinking like, oh, I can't believe these weird nerds are still asking us about this handful of videos we made 15 to 20 years ago. <laughs> so very happy that you agreed to come on for this. Thank you. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm sort of amongst some of the people as well who, uh, your you know, one of your films was one of the, it was the first brick film that I saw as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was um, the, the Monty Python one, uh, Holy Grail mm-hmm. on the DVD. Uh, that was pretty. I mean, I I think I probably had seen like a couple of other brick films before that, but nothing that was really kind of like, like you know, to this level. And it kind of completely changed how we well, yeah, changed everything because I made us think, mm-hmm. wow, this is like this is what you can actually do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, huge, you know, huge inspiration. And yeah, it is, it is funny. I mean, we, we, it is this one thing, uh, like Penn was saying, where like one of your films gets mentioned like almost every episode. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's good to know we've had an uh, influence. I mean, it, we made those things and, um, I, yeah, quite sometimes it, even in real life, I meet people and, you know, tell people about it and they're like, oh yeah, I remember that from the DVD or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good to know that is out there and people actually sort of been influenced by these things mm-hmm. yeah but kind of surreal i guess how have you how you guys on here because uh, the amount of times we've sort of talked about you as being pretty much kick-starting yeah with like, people's for know. me the the first brick film i saw was a scary thriller which is on the lego studios cd it came um. in one of the studio sets that i guess my brother would have gotten it because i was still really young at the time but yeah we watched that brick film on the cd all the time and i feel like i was Probably young enough that I just assumed it must have been CG because I didn't mm. really know about like how stop motion worked at the time. Yeah, scary, um, scary Thriller is a, a weird one for us. Yeah, I, I definitely would like to ask about Scary Thriller, especially because mm. it's the one that I remember uh, from from way back. I covered this in a history video that people might have seen. That um, the 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 one that's called the director's cut was actually the first version of Scary Thriller that was made. Yeah, um, yeah. it's too scary. It was too, it was too, <laughs> too scary. Basically, but yeah, that was. Yeah, we had to do some changes. Uh. Mm-hmm. That whole pro- project's basically weird for us because I think we just made we made the mistake of like listening to the client. Mm-hmm. We just shouldn't have listened to the client. There's like certain yeah. things they asked us to do that we just should never have done that make it kind of not really fit with with the rest of our catalog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in a way that we can like feel like super confident presenting. Yeah, I still kind of like it, but yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's more like, in a sense, it's more like the other Lego Studios stuff that we didn't do, the previous videos they had that were, you know, just they hired some animators to do it and we ended up a bit in that role, whereas other things, it's more like we somehow got them to let us do things we actually wanted to. 
Yeah, I mean, we still we we like the director's cut a lot in the community. <laughs> basically, basically, we should we should always have frame blended that film. We should have what? We should always have frame blended that film. Oh right, <laughs> that's like the main thing. It's like because they they you know they asked us you know it was you know because it was just kind of like content for the studio set and it was kind of designed to be like chopped up into bits as well as just watched as a whole thing in some Mm -hmm. ambiguous way um they asked us to you know make it you know which was a fair request they asked us to make it more like you know something that was kind of accessible to what the you know kids could do with the studio's set and all this sort of thing Mm. And because of that, we made the deliberate decision to not frame blend, which at that time, you know, you're, if you're working with like, you know, 90s, 2000s kind of VHS technology, basically, like even if you, even if you had sort of access to the so-called kind of Canon broadcast standard cameras that we had some, mm. some access to, you're still basically working with like a, v- a VHS standard definition image. Yeah, we were just capturing frames from uh, DV, I think. Yeah, and yeah. and the way that who was, was it even DV or was it like analog no, camera? I, I, I don't know. I don't even think so. I think it was just like VHS. Yeah, I think it was just the that weird capture card we had, and then just some high end, but still. And so, S- like you know, the, the films either side of that, like. You know the Python film and whatever; those are all like frame blended, which means that you know we were capturing like I don't know, like eleven individual frames at a time to to produce one frame to smooth out the video grain in an. Yeah, oh, we're kind of doing sort of fake long exposures, basically. Because I, I was confused there because <laughs> when we say frame blending nowadays, oh, yeah. it would mean something completely different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, I was just going to say because like the frame blending in in sort of the the other sense is something that we'd like. Yeah, no, I'm talking like, about like two thousand <laughs> era frame blending. Which yeah. Is, yeah, okay. Yeah. Because what what would be referred to as frame blending nowadays would be like the cardinal sin <laughs> <laughs> that would be you know generating AI generated frames mm. in between the frames you've taken and they they just look terrible. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah no, weird, no. Weird smoothness i understand what you mean now taking multiple exposures of the same frame and then combining all of those together yeah basically using analog technology to simulate the idea of multiple exposures mm. yeah and, I was that, gonna say, yeah, I... and that's something we did on on every film either side of scary thriller but for scary thriller we, we conceded not to and so the basic image quality is just it's like vhs image quality that you know i can't really be proud of or look at and 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 it's just kind of i don't know so it's just kind of awkward and we just shouldn't have done it we just should have like they wouldn't have you know they wouldn't have minded lego wouldn't have even have noticed if like yeah i can't same, even remember doing that deliberately if, i thought you know, just if, like the, that, if the same film yeah. came out with better yeah, image quality no, you it. they never would have complained and we just we just should have done it we just should have like followed our better instincts and frame blended that whole thing yeah but uh, the, the version of the director's cut i have it does have the the vhs line at the bottom yeah that's well that's the other thing that i, th- I think the director's cut is also the only copy of it we could find was a vhs copy that we'd made for some reason if i do some more hard drive archaeology i can probably find the actual f- movie file someday but well i think the movie <laughs> files exist across like something like you know 36 DVD burns or something, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, I don't know whether we can like even save the ex- entire thing. Extraordinary rebuild project of like, you know, 36 DVDs of which only like 32 work. And Wait a second, I think, actually I think I did find a master of it recently, but uh, maybe not. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'll have another look later. But I'll, I'll have to talk to you about that after the recording. <laughs> I think the VHS, the VHS rip, it kind of adds to it anyway, sort of um, video nasty style. 
Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. But, you know, we've always, especially the director's cut, we've always been very impressed by the lighting. And, you know, mm. not a lot of people were doing interesting lighting in 2002 and Rick filming. But also the, there's a shot where, like, the camera moves and all the skeletons come out of the ground. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. a fantastic shot. And yeah, then, like, yeah we like, but, I mean, that's the thing. We like stuff like that. There's individual things that we yeah. like about it. Um, I'm a fan of, like, that kind of rolling road thing that is basically oh, yeah. built around. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, Oh, so really cool. like a can of paint or something stupid. Yeah, it's just a know. paint can with like a road painted on it and stuff stuck to it. Like, did you have to submit a storyboard and show them the idea before you actually shot it? I mean, yeah, of course. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking because I was just surprised that they'd reject it. Like, what were you thinking when, when they came back and said that you have <laughs> spoken, to make a new version? Spoken like someone who hasn't dealt with animation clients much. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah, you'd think they would actually look at the storyboard and be like, hmm, yeah, this is what we'll actually get once they've filmed it, but apparently not. Uh, yeah, I can't really remember. I remember being annoyed. But... Yeah, I mean, I think you can tell also if, like, they're not a non-scary cut that, like, our enthusiasm just isn't there. Like, <laughs> we really, I kind of assumed that We're, we're, that that we're already nice. making this, like, non-frame-blended VHS-looking film that we weren't really happy with the, with the look of and then we had to make this like less scary version uh you know, purportedly less scary version and so i think our enthusiasm was like i think it's sort of demonstrably not there in the filmmaking i think you can tell yeah yeah the, the, i thought that that was just because you'd been asked to make it like not to the height of your abilities mm. yeah i mean um, it's a bit of both it's like we've been yeah. asked to make it not to the height of our abilities, and then we've been asked to make it not to the height of our, I don't know, our, our malice. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned that it was there was some idea about that people could like chop it up and use it, I guess, like edit bits into their own films, maybe. I was always wondering about, uh, do you remember that there's also some Spider-Man animation that was on the same disc? And this is, it's different to the Parallel Doc Ock. Yeah. It's like some... Very yeah. loosely connected shots. The, sp yeah. the Spider-Man <laughs> stuff is very strange. I'd mm -hmm. forgotten that existed entirely <laughs> until he mentioned it in the um, the video. That you know, the, sto oh, yeah. the, sto the story behind the the Spider-Man stuff was basically like we boarded a bunch of sequences that were that were designed to be chopped up, and basically pretty much all of them just consisted of like Spider-Man flying around and. Uh, the Green Goblin throwing bombs at stuff. Mm. And it, these are basically because these are just like a sort of two components that we knew we could work with in terms of like you know kind of asset management. It's just these, mm. these two ideas. But that weekend, nine eleven happened. Oh yeah. And so uh -huh. like, suddenly we weren't allowed to, to oh. do anything. It's exactly like, you know, the famous story about like how the actual movie Spider-Man, you know, had this like sequence where he spins the helicopter between the two towers and then <laughs> that, that all had to get cut out of yeah. the movie. It's basically the exact same thing happened to us. We just suddenly weren't allowed to like use bombs. Uh -oh. And that was like all we had. We literally just <laughs> had like a Spider-Man minifig and a Green Goblin on his gliding minifig <laughs> that threw these like pumpkin bombs and it's like suddenly we weren't allowed to throw or utilize bombs in any way so we just like just didn't even know what to do. What did we do? I literally can't remember. I literally can't remember. I like I like I don't know. I don't I, I think I'll have to I, get don't, the, I don't know what our solution was to any of it really. You know there's there's like two versions isn't there of that of that Spider-Man kind of video that's um at least on the wiki i noticed like it's like the version one it felt more like it it felt a bit more like coherent as like a story i could kind of follow it and version two it kind of i'm guessing that's what the edit that you did afterwards and where well, it's those, kind of like... those two versions are both on the disc oh okay but yeah i've always wondered about that spider-man stuff because like yeah it's not really a film uh it's just kind of loosely connected shots um so i guess yeah I was always wondering, it was there supposed to be more to it? I mean, I think there was more to it in the sense that, like, you know, the, this basic engagement of, like, guy one throws bombs, guy two probably catches the bombs in, in a web mm. or whatever. 
but like yeah that just that it was always supposed to just be uh footage for the for the lego movie yeah episode. i mean it was, it was never meant to be more it's than just it. supposed to be more footage for people to mess around with yeah um but i uh yeah i'll have to i've never actually used that software because we only have ever had Max back in the day, we never even saw <laughs> no, that. We never, we, we, we it. could never I mean, even like, open Lego never Studios. Looked. So we like, I think we looked at Lego Studios like once, like in the offices mm. in Slough. Yeah, that's the only time we've ever interacted with it. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I've still got a copy somewhere. I'll have to, um, I, I've got like Windows running on my Mac these days, so I can finally have a go. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was that was always pretty mysterious to me. Like, what mm. was the idea behind this Spider-Man clip? And that's, that is kind of what I figured that maybe it was supposed to be raw footage that people could just chop up in the editor. Yeah, they could have their own ideas about it and film, you know, other stuff to go with it, or whatever. So yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> they can invent your own context. But yeah, even within that that sort of limited framework, it just got dragged down to like nothing we couldn't, we couldn't do anything with it we could just have the green goblin just kind of fly around and cackle and mm. yeah well that, that certainly does make a more interesting backstory for it and it's true what they say that 9-11 affected everything even mm. brick filming <laughs> yeah yeah no that's, that's actually yeah, that's like, that's, i was just thinking that it's quite interesting how like i don't think we've ever had that you know like a story um when it comes to like you know brick films and stuff of like how uh, <laughs> it was affected by nine eleven, so that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, strange times. It's kind of funny. We we, we went straight for the obscure stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deep, deep cut. But you know, I suppose we ought to ask um, sort of general questions of like, if you could explain like, what was your history with Lego and stop motion to begin with? Um. um... Um, well, if you're gonna, if the, th- the thing is, if you're gonna get into the general history, you're gonna get into this kind of like question where, like, I, uh, for I don't want, I don't like Tim's a nice one. I don't want to drag <laughs> t- d- drag Tim into my kind of tirade, but like, I don't, <laughs> I don't really get Rick films. <laughs> <laughs> They've always been like a bit of a mystery to me, and I'm and I have a sort of weird like antagonism to them as a whole. They seem like I guess basically the way it works is that like what you have to what you have to be conscious of is, is if you've got if you've got like two guys who are like sort of famously they're like oh, these are the two guys that everybody is really influenced by. Is the guys that every, everyone's like. Oh, uh, this is the first time they saw a thing, and 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 they're sort of everyone's heroes, and they're all like the the guys whose films that everyone else looks up to and looks at as really like standing out from the crowd and all the rest of it. But the flip side of that is that you just have like these two guys who are kind of look at all of the rest of it with a with with a bit of a mystery and they're just like okay so why are all the rest of you guys films the same (laughs) (laughs) why if you're like if you're like really influenced by us why don't you do things that are more like us yeah why do you Uh, this is something why do you all do it in this like one like this really like one Mm. coherent other way because like brick films, you know, it does have like the the brick films that aren't our brick films. They do have like a singular kind of coherent vision, mm-hmm. and it's and it's singular coherent vision that like I I don't get. <laughs> yeah, I, I I know what you mean, especially because whenever I try to tell people about the Han Solo affair or the Pearl of Dark Ark today, I'm telling them like look at the shot composition and the the blocking of the characters, um, mm. you know, like th- th- these are things like in brick filming, like the, the quality of the stop motion animation has improved in leaps and bounds over the years. But I feel yeah. like the, the sort of general direction hasn't got, I mean, some people are really good. Mm. Uh, you have to kind yeah. of dig to find I mean, the best that's, that's yeah. the thing. Like there's, there's, but, but for me, it, in, in brick filming, there's, there's certain basic questions about filmmaking that just aren't asked 
Yeah. There's just certain questions that for film the filmmakers are just not asking themselves that to me are like really fundamental questions and I don't know why they're not <laughs> asking them, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I kind of have to assume that um, you're sort of basing that largely on what you would have seen on BrickFilms.com like years yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like mm. I, I like to, to to put it in a broader context. I, I think it is this like it's essentially the the, the problem that is a, is a sort of ubiquitous and well known subject now, which is the question of content versus mm-hmm. like filmmaking. And I think if you talk about like the the problem of content now, it's like it's something that's pretty well discussed around things like, you know, YouTube and Instagram and and all these sorts of things. And it's and it's kind of, it, 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 as a sort of millen as a it, as a sort of like twenty tens conversation, I think it's it's pretty well played out. But I've always felt like going all the way back to like 2000 that I I was kind of navigating the problem of content through (laughs) brickfilm.com. I think because, well, because it was an online scene as much as an actual genre of filmmaking. Yeah, I think it becomes, it's like, it. it becomes a meme in itself. So yeah, it's like partly. I mean, obviously not everyone, but a lot of people are just, they want to be in this, in the brick film scene. And yeah, like, break, because it's making kind of community Making a certain based. kind of thing is just what you do when you're there, so they do that. Because it's kind of community-based and, you know, it had all these, like, sort of internalised things of, like, you yeah. know, competitions and all these other sorts of things going on that I think it encouraged this idea of, just being kind of enamoured with the, the the idea of like some Lego moving <laughs> mm. and, and not not going beyond that, you know. Yeah, um, uh, it's like I, I know what you. I feel like uh, on Brickfilms dot com, everything was so insular, and all of the films mm. were incredibly similar to each other. And of course, I, I love a lot of those old films, but I know exactly yeah. what you mean in that nobody else was was doing what you were doing at that time and and of course for for many years later and it's like uh, i feel like nowadays people might be sort of confused as to what you're saying here uh because like well the communities are, mm. there's loads of different areas of brick filming nowadays and like where we are uh, with this podcast we're on bricks in motion which is essentially the spiritual successor to brickfilms.com and the, the people in the Bricks and Motion community sort of push filmmaking nowadays. You know, it took mm. them a long time to really get there, but there's a lot of people who are, you know, focusing on direction and that's, et cetera. That's, that's good. <laughs> but I mean, I, they I don't, mean, you, they don't get any views, like, you, you, know, <laughs> you should understand that I'm, I'm saying all these things basically from a position of ignorance because I like, <laughs> I've just, I've like, like, don't, don't, don't embarrass yourself by asking me like, what are some other brick films from other filmmakers that I'm inspired by? And uh, oh yeah, no, I, I figured I, 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 I haven't that, got. That I one, haven't yeah. got. <laughs> yeah, I kind of have. <laughs> I've, I've never. I've not watched any other brick films that are, like except like totally randomly, because like <laughs> usually because like you know some kid has messaged me and asked me to like check out their thing, and then I'm kind of flummoxed by what I see and try and find something polite <laughs> yeah. to say. It's just, I, I, just, I feel like explaining for uh, for anyone listening, yeah, because really the best stuff, you, you have to know where to look. You, you have to dig or you have to be very heavily involved. But mm. uh, yeah, there is there is stuff there now. But yeah, even even though I'm, I'm here saying this, I still feel as if the majority of people are still in that sort of mode of ju- they just point the camera and whatever happens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, I, I think I'm, I, you know, I'm aware increasingly that like definitely, you know, the quality of the stop motion is has improved a lot of what's out there. And I, can, you know, I, I, I sort of see that there's like a lot of guys doing like incredibly elaborate like Clone Wars animations where they're <laughs> doing like whole battles and all this sort of thing. But I, I, if there's still like a fundamental question of like, but why? 
and recreation. Who, who is this well, for? Yeah. Like, okay, you're you're like I see. I see it still like a lot of films that are just called like I don't know. Uh, you know, Iron Man buys a bagel, or <laughs> or, 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 or or like Darth Maul versus Doctor Strange car chase. Yeah, and it's well, like okay, you you as an individual are like re- like you you love these these two characters. You you really want th- these are your two favorite most badass minifigs, and you want to see them like engage in this like particular conflict uh, but what's what's supposed to be my buy-in <laughs> you know as as, <laughs> as, a, as a third person as a general audience what why am i supposed to share your like incredible enthusiasm to see these like specific minifigs mm. kind of yeah that's that's what gets all the views and the attention uh, mm. of course among kids um and of course, us community insiders, yeah, we we complain about that sort of stuff too. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I guess one difference with our films was that you know when we were doing it, it was like sort of the gag was that it was like you know it was like two thousand one a space odyssey but made of Lego, and that was like the gag. But with the big films community, the the fact that it's Lego is just a given, and it's kind of like a different, yeah. It's yeah, well, so well, I, I, I certainly disagree because I think been... I think the whole I think what separates our films is that we never fell back on that gag. If you look yeah, at like, that as well, you, like you know, yeah. I, I, you know, the reason that something like the Holy Grail film can just be you know watched now, twenty years later, just just sort of picked up as a new commodity and and enjoyed, I think, is basically the same mechanism by which like what's up for doc can be enjoyed mm. i think we, if there's a basic like pursuit of like you know sh- short film history what what is yeah. a short film what is a sh- what is a short animation what is what it what is what has been the context for short animations in the past and then we've kind of like inscribed a lot of that history into the way that we've constructed the films so that they do, they do stand up as because you know that you know that film like uh the python one you know it, it was it's totally within its remit like we were basically asked to you know make something that could very easily just fall back on you know the soundtrack that it has of like Here's a famous funny song that we mm. didn't have to put any effort into producing and just fall back on, like having a bunch of Lego and, and do like the title says, Monty Python and the Holy Grail and Lego. But that isn't what we did. Mm-hmm. What we did instead is like there's uh, it's it's kind of, like a lot of our films. It's it's kind of an essay on like the mechanics of filmmaking. Yeah, we've gone into this like incredible yeah. level of detail about like what what makes that particular film funny and how that film is constructed. You know, you've got mm. you've got all this sort of stuff where like it's co-directed by Terry Gilliam and Terry Jones, and there's these two very sort of competing visions going on throughout, and we've like really like deliberately like played into and kind of repeated some of that stuff or that or there's like you know the fact that the the source film itself is like created on like a very limited budget and under very mm. limited circumstances so we've like <laughs> really leaned into like like d- details that you you wouldn't even know to look for unless you'd like studied this stupid song sequence frame by frame like Mm -hmm. where um there's an alcove that is just like redressed the same way like in the original real film there's an alcove that is just like the same alcove redressed three different ways with like slightly different blankets to look like three different parts of a castle Mm -hmm. and it's not it's the same part of the castle and so we recreated that and have 
you know, we, we, we readdressed the same alcove in the same way. So it becomes this kind of, you know, that level of, of like detail and attention makes it a kind of piece of filmmaking about filmmaking, mm-hmm. which is the thing mm-hmm. that elevates it to being something that, like, is sort of timeless and that you can, mm-hmm. like, step into. Yeah. It's not. It, it's not. Think, it's not the quality of the stop motion or or any of that nonsense. You know, <laughs> there's a shot in the in the original movie. There's a shot where they have, they cut to a shot of a forest, and it's literally a shot of a, ca- a photo of a forest in a, on a calendar in their office wall, and with like a, a candle held underneath to make like some haze, and they just shot that and put it in the film. And then we kind of did the weird inverse. We took the castle model to an actual mountain and shot it on a mountain and then <laughs> ended up photoshopping it so badly that it looks like just a picture. So it's kind of like, I just, yeah, it's kind of this weird yeah, it's it's how much into effort they put into that. Completely pointless endeavor taking the castle up, mm. up the mountain. We just totally photoshopped it. But nonetheless, we did do it. We took, yeah. a, we took a castle up a mountain. That yeah. was the thing that we did. <laughs> That's a good pack story, all right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the the attention to detail, um, you know, in recreating the original is just really impressive because I, I, loads of times I've I've like watched them back to back to kind of sort of like see and and I actually did uh, again uh, just a little earlier and um, yeah, it's it's really impressive just like how much you've managed to um, well not only kind of you know recreate it really faithfully but at the same time um, add add enough of your own kind of uniqueness you know your own characters sort of to it you know that it isn't just like uh you know there, there are some bits to it that are like different as well yeah you know? there's there's deviations yeah. like the uh the thing with the parrot which was, which basically we did the parrot thing because like we did we just did a, we did do like a straight thing of the cat like what, what at that po- the audio at that point in the song is somebody kicks a cat and we mm. just use the same piece of audio and like declare that it's a parrot and had this kind of parrot sketch <laughs> reference. Mm. And we basically did that because like the cat thing just didn't work. Like like we tried to animate somebody like squishing a cat, but you can't squish a, a plastic cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it true that you made that film in about a week or less? It's yeah, it was a seven day mm. shoot. Oh, yeah. I think it, no, I, I think I it might even have been a seven day delivery, like Five day shoot, seven day. Yeah, something crazy. And that was just in our living room as well. And it was just in our living room. room. Natural studio. Just insane. Like, but it makes a lot of sense to me that you referenced what's opera doc, uh, especially mm. in regards to the Han Solo affair. I feel like the, uh, that doesn't feel like other brick films. It feels more like Looney Tunes or yeah. Buster I mean, Beacon absolutely. Films, like those, the, those late, basically the earlier ones. I think they're they they all share a thing of being kind of like essays about filmmaking like all of the dead one of space odyssey you know they're all they're all kind of these like they're, they're kind of focused on like you know films about filmmaking that mm. like really like don't fall back on the lego aspect and mm. are, like focused on trying to recreate the film to maximum accuracy in all sorts of other like non-lego related ways but then, like the later ones, particularly Han Solo Affair and Pearl and uh, Pearl of Dark Ark, are like very directly Looney Tunes informed. They're absolutely like fo- just following the logic of like that is what a short film is. Like if you've got mm-hmm. the budget to like really just go out there and make a, a silly short film, that mm-hmm. is, that is like the historical framework for like when the best short films were made and in the yeah. greatest number and by the most talented people. So that's what you should be falling back on if you're going to make a short film. Yeah. yeah. Uh, looking at it that way, your, like, your films, as they kind of progress, how they they kind of become increasingly more cartoony um, in, in a sense where, yeah, like you're saying with One Space Odyssey and, and you know, those sort of earlier films feel kind of a bit more, like they're not really using the medium that much. Whereas like, I think with like, especially against like Power of Doc Ock, you've got things like, you know, when... You know, the stuff like I find really, really sort of fun visually, like when, uh, you know, Doc Hawk has got the elephant, he sort of throws it mm-hmm. at Spider Man, and, you know, oh, yeah. he gets the webs and catches it and all that kind of stuff. 
But this is an idea that we've sort of been trying to push recently, uh, especially on this podcast. We're kind of always talking about like that how people shouldn't be influenced by other brick films primarily, and they should be mm. watching real films. They should be watching old short films and classic animation. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a very interesting phenomenon I encountered quite recently looking at some of the comments on per, uh, Pearl of Duck Ock, where the extent to which that that film is it like absolutely is a Looney Tune and just follows like Looney Tune's logic is completely not understood by a contemporary <clears throat> audience whatsoever to the extent yeah. where like as far as I'm concerned the logic of Princess Leia and everything that Princess Leia is doing is Bugs Bunny logic. So when mm. Princess Leia points out to Darth Vader that, that Luke is like getting away with the, the, the thing, she's pointing it out because there's nothing he can do about it. It's already too late. She, it, it, It's a classic, like, the, to me, the internal logic of anything that Princess Leia is doing in that movie is. Uh, like the logic of Bugs Bunny camping, that she's basically just, you know, she's trolling Darth Vader mm-hmm. by, by pointing pointing out to him various things that he essentially can't do anything about. It's already too late. But this uh, this kind of f- pretty common phenomenon within like the logic of religion is absolutely not understood by a contemporary audience. And there's mm-hmm. always comment going like. Why is why is this why I'm so sexist? Why is Princess Leia so stupid? <laughs> People projecting. <laughs> That's yeah, funny. They really are. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's an absolutely fascinating phenomenon. To me. I've just like never questioned the mm. the the logic of the Bugs Bunny yeah. logic in like twenty years, and then I just sort of discover like really like decades after the fact. We're just having this like totally different read on on what that means. I I don't know if young people still watch Looney Tunes when they're actually young anymore. I know I know I certainly did, but um, mm. yeah, I've always felt like I remember when I was really really young and I watched the Han Solo Fair and and your other films. Like I could tell that they were more engaging than most of the other brick films I was watching, but I wouldn't have been able to articulate why. Mm. And you know, it's only in re- more recent years when I have an in- now with an interest in like real filmmaking and the history of animation and stuff i'm sort of piecing it together like oh that's what they were doing all along <laughs> yeah yeah and like you know i think that's that's just that, that's especially kind of all that's going on in like uh the peril of duck arc you know i don't i don't, I don't think you know it has like basic basically like we we, we got the money to make a, a film that we wanted to make with that one and so it just it just kind of is that it is just like a highly elaborate looney tune it's like uh it's like kind of big tech savory kind of thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i think <laughs> it's like the logic of, of that film yeah i love t- tech savory stuff that is interesting uh kind of a huge chunk of audience not necessarily having that uh kind of context mm. uh <laughs> i'm not even saying that i even thought about actually um but speaking of the Peril of Doc Ock being, you know, something that you you make you wanted to make, um, mm. why is it that there's an alternate ending version? Um, I can't. Was that was it always the idea to have two endings just so there would be an alternate ending? Well, well, the, the thing with the Peril of Doc Ock, that that film, like, unfortunately, like it's like it's like kind of you know it's like our best most elaborate film, and it's like a film that probably you know. Like made us the most famous and and was like this huge kind of phenomenon in in the summer that it was released and mm-hmm. kind of was accessible for all these kind of platforms. But unfortunately, it also bankrupted us. <laughs> it was the film that completely bankrupted like the first iteration of Spite Your Face and forced us to like quit and go off to London and get actual jobs. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Because, because we budgeted for, uh, uh, we planned and budgeted for like a six week shoot, and a six week shoot is what we made. But unfortunately, just for like various sort of corporate type reasons, it took us six months to get paid hmm. 
Yeah. And and so in like in that interim period, like we just you know we just ran out of money. We didn't have a second kind of backup project going mm. that that could sort of you know pay pay the bills while we were waiting to get like basically one box um from to be un to be sort of unlocked for yeah. at the end of that whole project. So okay. so there is like a, a lot of controversy around like for us uh, around like the actual like background goings on of what was what was going on behind it. And the big like resentment for us was that we'd made it under those particular circumstances. We'd agreed to the six week shoot because the promise had always been that it would feature as a extra on the Spider Man two D V D. And you have to understand that in like two thousand and four that like Spider Man two D V D like DVDs were still like a big phenomenon. Yeah. And the, the, the Spider Man two D V D was absolutely like the product of the summer. <laughs> it's like it's like something that absolutely everybody would have gone and bought. Mm. It would have just been like a huge, huge big deal for it to be on that DVD. And I think yeah. the two versions had something to do with there being, you know, uh, I don't know, like an alternate ending or something to do with like having, you know, one ending that was like exclusive to the DVD. Okay. And, something and like that, that yeah. Another oh, okay. that we could put on like cover discs and other kinds of materials. Something, something like that. I don't really recall. Mm. That was like in which. Um, I, I was wondering if it was kind of a similar situation uh, to what you had with Scary Thriller. I was like, you know, like one same, is sort yeah. of darker and, and one's, you know, more like uh, lighter kind of thing. Yeah, you, um, you, you would actually think that, but I don't think that was the case because they are very similar in that, like, you know, one, one of them has a blatant Evil Dead ending. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. It's obviously like where like uh, you know we're kind of like riffing on Sam Raimi as the whole thing. Like it's basically ten x Avery x Sam Raimi is like what we're doing there, <laughs> and uh, obviously we're, we're coming at that much more as like Evil Dead fans than the Spider Man fans. Yeah. So, yeah. so that that kind of that kind of thing comes through. So you would think it was that, but there's like, oh, one ending was like too, too scary and weird or something. But I don't actually think. No, I think it was always the plan just to have two versions for promotional purposes. Two versions. So I guess the the longer version would have been on the DVD has a like an incentive to buy the DVD, get the unseen version. Okay. (laughs) But then yeah, they didn't. um, They just didn't make it happen. Basically, so we were really annoyed. Got dis- dis- disillusioned. I can about, imagine, uh, yeah. Doing any more Lego films. I think I was kind of wondering, like, did Lego object to Doc Ock being electrocuted at the end of the alternate version? No, no. <laughs> what they weirdly did object to was, I can't remember where, whether it made it in or not. We, we had a gag when Spider Man's fighting Doc Ock and, you know, he's like fighting the arms and then, like, Doc Ock is just like relaxing and doing whatever. And there was a gag where he was like, drinking a glass of wine and stuff they get cutting back to him and he's like doing all this like chilled out stuff while the arm, robot arms were fighting and uh and they they were like uh you know uh, the you, see, you see him reading a book in the film yeah, yeah yeah but we had a we had a couple of different gags where he was like just yeah just like drinking wine or whatever and they were like you know someone from sony looked at it and were like Oh, this is completely out of character. Like Doc Ock would never do this. <laughs> exactly, blah, blah, blah. Exactly right. <laughs> and this, we made this before. I, like, I would totally like you know go in and say it was Avi Arad who made that decision. Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah. But, but, then, the, but then when we went and watched, because like, we made it before the actual film came out. Yeah. Oh, and then right. we went to to the cinema to see Spider Man Two. And it had that gag in it, mm-hmm. as, as I remember, or <laughs> something very similar. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, they just didn't know their own franchise at some level. Yeah. And we did. <laughs> I've always really loved that in the alternate ending, that shot. We were in, in sort of like the docks and you've got like the, the chains and mm. the, the glowing lights, the windows. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it has that kind of like horror kind of movie kind of feel to it. Um, 
I, yeah, I always enjoyed that. Kind of, I always liked that kind of shot. And then like the the way um you know one of Duck Hawk's arms like kind of like comes out from the ground and starts you know moving. Yeah, yeah, we're really happy with that. I remember. Yeah, I really like the alternate ending version. I, I I kind of yeah consider that to be like the the real one. Whenever I watch yeah, the original, yeah, that's kind one, of yeah. I, mean, kind of how I think really the the, the alternate ending even makes it look weirder. It actually captures the the spirit of most of what's going on in the actual movie. Like, mm. like you know, in the movie, Doc Doc Ock does basically like get electrocuted and drowns. Like that's what happens. And and yeah. Also, I think we had, I think like, but you know, like Tim says, we made the, we made it before the film came out, and so we were going on just like some very scant information from basically the first kind of teaser trailer, which came out, I think maybe like three days before we started shooting. Yeah, so that was <laughs> something that we had. Like we'd all, you know, way after we'd already storyboarded and everything, but. But we had kind of that as a reference point, and like that is um actually yeah thinking about it now it actually is quite surprising to me that like you didn't you hadn't seen it you know you hadn't seen it when you made it because like yeah. the ending it kind of feels like it's basically the end of Spider Man Two yeah. <laughs> yeah we just we kind of just knew we kind of just predicted what they would do basically we kind of, I guess we just knew what Sam Raimi would do <laughs> what we had <laughs> what we had dead enough time. Was, before, like the, you know, like like I say, we got to see like the same teaser trailer as, as the rest of the world, basically, about three days before we started shooting. And prior to that, all we had was actually the same thing that was the only thing that the like the toy makers had, which is like it's a very limited selection of like random photocopied kind of production art. Mm. That gave you like, that like gave the toy makers enough of a f- framework to know that like they should make a shed, they set, and they should make a little train, <laughs> and then like, these are going to be kind of the main things. But I think we were able to intuit from that very limited amount of material that like there is going to be this big elaborate train chase sequence which is like one of the mm. classic like it is a really good like you know the actual movie version of that train sequence it's like a really good action sequence yeah. up. and i think we were, we, we were just we were able to ensure it through like knowing sam raimi and mm-hmm. being able mm. to like determine the, the, the general structure of the film like if we just put a big train sequence at the, at the center of our movie uh, you know, we'll be in a, sort of in a safe place. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, All of the Dead, of course, very reminiscent of Evil Dead. Yeah. We used to watch the entire Evil Dead trilogy like ridiculously often uh, back in <laughs> uni days. And yeah. Something like once a month back in those Yeah, days. at least. I, I was, uh, I've been archiving loads of my old like college films and stuff. Uh, you know, getting them transferred from ancient tapes and stuff. And I'd say about half of my work has on the soundtrack just audio from the Evil Dead <laughs> ripped on, on like a cassette recorder or something. Actually, what's what's up with the soundtrack of All of the Dead? Because I've always thought it was really funny. But oh, yeah. Did you make that yourself? Uh, yeah. How do we even make that? Yeah, I mean, I think that like it's really basically just like constructed out of like what we could even make as, as like non-musicians. I think it is. I think part of it is some random old record, like yeah, just that's what I was man- manually played at the wrong speed by you know twirling on the turntable, yes. and then some Casio keyboard or something. It sounds like yeah. some loops, <laughs> something. Yeah, they occasionally warp, and the speed changes and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you mentioned that um, Parallel Doc Ock was huge on the internet on all sorts of different platforms and yeah that's this is something that i've been trying to sort of uh, remind people about like nowadays young people speak about the internet as if it only started with youtube essentially yeah and so i'm kind of i've been trying to tell people like no there was this whole thing going on before youtube existed and yeah like the part of doc Ock was absolutely a viral video before youtube existed yeah i mean yeah. Like, to be honest like we never survived youtube which mm-hmm. kind of killed it like yeah. the, 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 the the other thing with like the Pearl of Dark Heart is that like 
that the huge phenomenon of it, the fact that it was all like number one film on like iTunes and iFilm and all these other weird websites that you used to get. That was something that basically me and Tim did all of. Hmm. Like we mm-hmm. have, we personally pushed like every single like upload and listing of that, of that video ourselves. Like mm-hmm. we were, like we, like we went up. Do you remember Tim? We went up to like the, we like went up to like Harrow College where our friend worked and had sort of, you know, better internet than we had at home. Mm. Just like basically manually c- constructed that entire like, uh, sort of viral program, like on our Todd with like n- no, no support from like. Yeah, yeah, because, right. yeah, Lego were just happy to have it at that point, at least, you know, they didn't have the whole social media managers and whatever, so they were just, they would have now, so they would, to them, it was just like, okay, we have this thing, it goes on the Lego website, maybe for only a limited time, and that's it, whereas we were like, uh, we should probably put this on the internet, mm-hmm. <laughs> so we just, yeah, just submitted it to everything ourselves. Lego themselves always had very limited kind of toy manufacturer ideas about like what was the use and potential of these things and it was always something like let's just put it on this particular obscure url within the the lego website Mm -hmm. for like weeks and Mm -hmm. that was like the extent of their ambition Mm. yeah uh, well i know that they might have got moved around a couple of times but those films did remain on the lego website for many many years and i yeah that's i think that's largely how so many people say that they're some of the first victims they ever saw because like we've even spoken to people on the podcast here who they say like when they were really young kids their parents didn't let them go on youtube but they mm. could still find the han solo affair on the lego website and okay. they just watch that all the time <laughs> so that's how they got into brick filming mm. and it's kind of surprising i mean like obviously like the legacy that's uh films like i think especially like han solo affair and uh pearl dog hawk had is that like you've got multiple i guess like eras of brick filmers you know like or like mm. do- generations of brick filmers that were kind of you know had had seen them because like yeah you're going back to like the early 2000s but like you know i think some into like the late 2000s and early 2010s would have also seen them as well yeah i mean you say that youtube killed you but like those those brick films do have a, the original uploads of them have a couple of million views on YouTube, I think. Yeah. So yeah, that a lot yeah, of people saw them first I there. A couple of million views, very modest compared to the numbers that we were doing in two thousand four. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was all spread across these different sites, and uh, yeah, it was kind of a different different internet landscape. Yeah, but between the way you were making viral videos before YouTube, mm-hmm. and also the the scale and quality of the brick film itself uh, and like the way it has city streets and buildings in the background and everything it always seems like everything you were doing was like visions of the future <laughs> yeah you know it's like one day many years from now people will be making mm-hmm. brick films like this <laughs> yeah <laughs> which they have they, they have started to do in recent years yeah <laughs> I, i'm actually always like really frustrated with some of this like, like obviously they are kind of like really huge and incredible and whatever but like basically i built all of the cityscapes for that film in like one weekend mm. uh, i built pretty much all of all of the new york buildings in like two days so i'm kind of really frustrated with like how little i think it looks like new york <laughs> <laughs> it, it still bugs me massively yeah. it, like, it's have to pretend it was actually shot in canada it, yeah, I mean, it does sort of look like Boston or something like that. It doesn't really, it doesn't really have that New York vibe. I mean, I guess it it might bug you, but like, I know that from the brick filmer perspective, at, at that point in time, people weren't doing mm. anything with set design. Like, they just have one big basic flat wall, and that was good enough. So, like, this was some of the best stuff going at the time, as far as set design goes. You know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, most people wouldn't have been able to get that much Lego. That's, I guess you know? that's true too. It was <laughs> like we we were so, yeah, it was. I mean, it was pretty amazing being able to just go and like do supermarket sweep at the Lego places and get as you know much of ridiculous colors that no one could even mm. get and things like that. Like the one where um, you know Joe Jonah Jameson lives at the top of this like ridiculous giant tower. Like most people would, wouldn't have been wouldn't have been able to build that. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, something that I did actually want to sort of bring up, uh, I think with, with um, the the Holy Grail in Lego, there's you know a few pieces like the helmets and stuff which were like <laughs> oh. never actually released to the public. <laughs> yeah, there's like a mace or something one of the knights has that just doesn't actually exist, but we had a load of them. <laughs> we managed to get some prototypes. Which I, I guess was a terrible mistake because for the, the rest of time you have people asking you, hey, what set did that come in? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> the bit of his helmet is actually from like, I, I, I recall it being from like some sort of like proto ice hockey thing that they were oh, right. experimenting with at the time. It's not even a medieval helmet at all. It's like a weird ice hockey helmet. That's that's what bit of his got and everybody always wants to know like, mm. what <laughs> and uh, the Pearl of Doc Ock was the first brick film with uh, flesh coloured minifigures and uh, oh, yeah. I believe you had a an interesting perspective uh, am I right in thinking that you you figured that flesh minifigures was like you know the way to go I mean yellow min- yellow minifigures are just dead that's <laughs> like, it's like that's my personal like holiday. it's like you know the fact that the first time I saw a flesh minifig was somebody just handed one to me and placed it in my hand and just said like you know we're doing this and it was mm-hmm. like it, you know it was like that's kind of a 2001 moment like what what is this <laughs> what am i even looking at and like yeah yellow, yellow minifigs have just have just been like dead to me ever since yeah, I've always I found that kind of amusing because you know for the longest time, Lego fans and brick filmers hated the fleshy minifigs and didn't want to use them. They 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 use them now because that's what comes in all the the Star Wars superhero sets and that's what most yeah. of the brick filmers yeah. are based on. But I I feel like uh, I I read some old posts you had made about that um about thinking that yeah, you know flesh is the way to go and stuff and I didn't entirely agree but. Uh, it it got me thinking about the um, the earth tones, like I think you were you were also talking about like doing the realistic earth tone sets, and you can see that the part of Doc Ock, you have a lot of the tan buildings and stuff. Hmm. And of course, in brick filling, we'd always just make everything out of just red and blue and yellow because that's that's all we had in, yeah. in decent enough supply. But I think be, reading you talking about that, uh, you know, deliberate use of color palette and stuff is what really got me thinking about that to in the first place, and then. Then I, I went and bought loads of bricks in like tan and brown and, and started <laughs> making the, the earth tone sets. And then I feel like the, the colorful minifigures stand out against them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just from like, you know, photography perspective, they're just phenomenal. You know, why, 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 why having opened up the potential to have like minifig photography mirror directly, you know, the, 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 the potentials of like live action photography and have the you know the flesh tones match and have mm. flesh tones be like a part of your like knees on set and like why would you ever go back? Why why would you why would you want like weird bright yellow dudes after that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah um, I mean I I guess I, I keep saying a, a similar thing, but again it's like something that we've kind of only been pushing in recent years is the sort of more deliberate use of color palette and mm. considering to yourself that yeah you could make things in in more grounded earth tones if if that's the look you're going for yeah we, we were kind of always obsessed with the beginning from the beginning of you know i mean we kind of early on we're doing the 2001 so we were obviously trying to just get loads of you know from a meager amount of lego we could get hold of just find loads of white pieces to make all the um you know spaceship interiors and stuff and yeah we've always been yeah like, like uh, and, and and the python movie is like out out you know obviously like species didn't exist back then but outside of this kind of the part the part of the film where we we're deliberately evoking sort of 1970s like early castle like i mm. you know used as many things like Everything outside of that, the use of minifigs is like, you know, trying to use as much dark grey and brown as possible. Because dark, dark grey and brown, brown were still like exciting new colours. Yeah. <laughs> really like amazed at how much dark grey and brown 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess that does make a lot of sense that it, it would have been borderline impossible for anyone else who couldn't yeah get stuff from the Lego group <laughs> at, at that point in time. Mm. Mm. I mean, I guess BrickLink did exist, but I, I don't know uh, what quantities you would have been able to get on BrickLink. Yeah, it would have been difficult and expensive. Yeah, because that's what I do now, is I, mm. I BrickLink all the, the fancy colors yeah. that I want. I remember even before, um, I mean, obviously we didn't use any in the official Lego movies, but I remember when we really first started out, we were obsessed with, you know, we'd find like some weird fake Lego in the pound shop and we'd be like buying things just because it had like some weird pink brick or something mm -hmm. that was just a color you couldn't get in actual Lego. And we'd just like <laughs> stop piling these weird things. Mm -hmm. And of course, now pretty much every color you could imagine exists as official yeah. Lego. Yeah, that is interesting. I think like uh, how... Uh... Really, you you were kind of around for the real kind of start of like that, uh, you know, the more realistic like Earth kind of tones and 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 stuff with with uh, the Lego and going towards more kind of I guess contemporary stuff that we have today. Um, but uh, it is interesting. I think uh, I I feel like one of the things that you know, does does stand out a lot with your with your films is that another thing that makes them kind of age really well. I think not not just like the the kind of the color palette and stuff that you you know the stuff that you kind of thought about but also i think like stuff like um the yeah like i think the use of like i guess cinematography and stuff in general and that kind of thing which i feel like uh they feel like you know things that are just sort of like you know standard sort of filmmaking principles that are like weren't really thought about as much in the kind of brickfilms.com mm. era <laughs> um and i think we're kind of getting towards more you know towards that now i think in terms of like really thinking about these mm -hmm. these kind of elements yeah. that yeah. that make film you know i wonder <laughs> do you remember zach macias he did the sound for the bricks motion documentary so you would have met, oh, yeah. met him when you were interviewed yeah. yeah 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 he the first brick film he saw was the pair of doc Ock in 2004 and and he's mm. still active and still really pushing things and mm. uh, pushing cool. filmmaking aspects within brick filming yeah i think um Part of, uh, to some extent, it's it's a thing that's just inherent in stop motion is that people realize they can do stop motion, so they just like put stuff on the table and move it around. And even <laughs> yeah, I've always been kind of trying to make even non Lego animation. I was doing, you know, I was always trying to make it look like a film with an actual in an actual place in in a set rather than just like. Whereas yeah, a lot of brick films and a lot of yeah stop motion in general, even quite good high end things, it's not that cinematic interesting phenomenon i think in like all of the dead mm. where like all of the dead obviously like predates most brick films so i don't even know where like we got this concept just some sort of like general cultural osmosis idea that like what other super eight brick film experiments maybe looked like but we we had the like we made this, you know, very conscious decision that like base plates are cheating mm. and brick and like brick walking is cheating. Like so, you know, that film has Even though yeah, that wasn't even a thing then, but we somehow knew it. <laughs> kind of we like sort of somehow knew it was a thing and decided that it was a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so you've got this like um plasticine, yeah. you know, plasticine snow. Yeah. And that all the walking in that film is like sort of standard walk cycle kind of walking where it's the, the walking is predicated on like, you know, the, 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 two, the, you know, the two legs are at 45 degree angles at their most extreme rather than this like weird kind of take a step forward and then magically appear on the next block <laughs> of the brick walk thing that that all the other films are sort of satisfied with, but I've always found like really alienating. Yeah, mm. we always complain about walking <laughs> very often, <laughs> and it's this. It's something that it continues to this day. Uh, people consider it to be more impressive uh, to do the walking on smooth surfaces and break free yeah. of the rigidity of studs. Yeah, mm. there is a thing I feel like. Uh... Uh, so many uh, advantages that uh, brick films have that kind of feel a bit like cheating in a way compared to all other forms of like stop motion where like you know generally 
speaking was like pretty much any other form of stop motion you've got like rigs and all that kind of stuff and mm. you know you are going to be animating on smooth surfaces whereas like lego you know you've got like yeah studs and they just like move around really easily and it kind of just feels like um yeah it, like compared to most forms of stop motion it can seem very very easy i guess in a yeah. sense so finding ways to make it harder for yourself and and, and be more <laughs> like traditional stop motion is always going to be yeah. um i think you know most, sort of admired. most things <laughs> most things are easy compared to stop motion to be fair <laughs> yeah. i also just think you know like basically like i'm kind of really just like anti uh base play in general yeah i'm like i'm like a huge fan of the new like grip built road things that Lego have bought out in the last year. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of like the, the death of base plate. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but, but I, think I think base plates are just like really fourth wall breaking and ugly. It's just that like, it, it, there's something about like, it's basically impossible to, like even if you do fill your like pavement up with like smooth plates or whatever, the, the 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 scale of the of the kind of gutter between the road and the pavement is just uh, like too big and ugly and wrong, mm-hmm. and so it's pretty much impossible to make like an attractive, absorbing like base plate based kind of town, mm-hmm. and so it just makes any brick film that like works on that premise just kind of just look like a bunch of, you know, toys on a table, which is, mm-hmm. exactly, which is exactly what you don't want, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. I think that we've definitely, that's definitely something that I have noticed uh, over the last, like, few years, is that, like, um, less and less people seem to be using base plates in their brick films. Mm. Yeah, um, right. And I think, you know, like, <laughs> I, I, I think that it's uh, for, the, for the best, because I think, like, more now you see people having, like, more complex kind of, like, bases that they create themselves uh, like on platforms so that you know you can sort of fit your camera like in between and and you know get different angles stuff like that because that's another thing as well with like um depending on what your setup is but you know for a lot of people that use like webcams and stuff if you've got it on like a base plate it's very much it's very close to the the you know the table just the table and there's nothing uh, like beneath it and it means that like you're having to kind of adjust your camera in a way where it's like you know it, it's sort of you're not able to get low angles very easily yeah so true. i think once you once you kind of say to yourself like i'm not you know i'm not i'm not going to use base plates anymore you actually realize how much how freeing it is i think <laughs> yeah but you kind of mentioned there something about like cultural osmosis of um super eight lego experiments like had you actually seen any other lego animation by other people before you've made all the dead Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's I mean, what I was thinking, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like, you know, in the years since, like, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Magic Portal. Yeah. You know, Magic Portal is this, like, huge boom dongle that hangs over all the brick films. <laughs> yeah. Because it just, like, it's kind of done the gag in the, in the course of its whole thing, you know, because it, it kind of starts out pretending to be a brick film again like before brick films even existed it's sort of pretending to be one mm. you into thinking it's just going to be like minutes and minutes of like stud walking down this like boring corridor <laughs> until until okay. it like introduces the eponymous magic portal and then just just like evolves mm. you know it, go, it goes from like being like a, a pretend brick film to like want a space odyssey to like beyond anything that, that we've ever done into this just kind of like you know shoe chasing madness <laughs> and, and and i think that like presents a huge problem for for brick films as a whole because it's like you, you know, your your thing has already been done and mm-hmm. kind of evolved and sort of superseded and like no, just yeah, just all in the course of this one film, and 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 like decades in advance of like, yeah. your stuff existing. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, I think at the time of when we made uh, all of the dead, I think I just I remembered like Lego seventies eighties stop motion from ads 
maybe you know when I was a kid I saw a Lego ad with some stop motion but mm. apart from that I mean it was um, our main influence was Tony's uh, Lego films from before uh, you know from before college even these sort of semi mostly just live action <laughs> Lego films and stick ones yeah which um, for, me, for me all of the dead I think was just like you know, it's just this like weird straight ahead kind of animation experiment, but it was kind of like finding out that I actually could stop motion animate. Because mm-hmm. like Tim has all this history with, you know, doing like Super 8 films since he was like a teenager, but I really didn't. I, I was like 2D animation guy. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I, was, I really found out through really, all really the dead that I actually could. Yeah, you should animate like, pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Before I before mm-hmm. I found brick filming, I was drawing comics. So I I guess I assume you were similar. Yeah, similar. I was, I was, I was basically like frustrated anime guy. But yeah, mostly drew comics a lot as a teenager, mm-hmm. and wanted to be doing some sort of anime something rather than that. No, it never really panned out. Mm-hmm. Down this weird stop motion path. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that I feel is almost like a sort of vision of the future uh, with regards to. It's like it seems like you had interests that became much more popular on the internet in the following decades. It's like I was, you know, yeah. looking at an archive of of a web, of uh, Tim's website, mm-hmm. and it mentioned like um, coming soon, or maybe it was up there already in like 99 or 2000, Lego Evangelion pictures. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking those. like, that that would make perfect sense in this day and age. Yeah, exactly. That must have been yeah. the most niche, obscure thing you <laughs> could imagine back then. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, at the moment I feel just, um, I don't know if any of you have read, um, read the manga 20th Century Boys, but basically it's, I feel like that at the moment, like every weird nerd interest I had when I was a kid is now like some sort of world changing death cult <laughs> that's like <laughs> yeah. changed all of society for the worst <laughs> that's i can't argue with that uh, if we're talking about star wars <laughs> yeah but like yeah at the time you know being into star wars or anime or whatever seemed like some sort of niche thing and now it's like yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i imagine when when you were asked to do an official star wars video that must have been i mean mm. you know it's like nowadays there's there's endless official star wars animations on the lego youtube channel but like back then it must have been the biggest deal in the world yeah well, m- well i mean it was literally like because we made the decision to make an actual short film like somebody came to us and they said you know somebody came to us and basically said make some star wars content and we went no we're not gonna make some star wars content we can make a star wars short film mm. And in so doing, you know, it is the first Star Wars short film since the Boba Fett film in 1977. Yeah. Mm. Like, there's, no, there's no other short film between them, you know. There's isolated bodies of random, like, you know, animated content in some, like, Burger King commercial. Yeah. I'm sure that, you know, there's, there's these little bits and bobs that animated material under the Star Wars brand, but in terms of making a short film under license that has a beginning, a middle and an end, like, yeah, there's just nothing between us and Boba Fett, like, could we mm. create the Clone Wars and all of that? The stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah it, was pretty, it was pretty exciting. Uh, which, because which, originally they were showing us some of the, you know, we were going to do something based on like the new Star Wars things was kind of what they wanted originally. Yeah, I, was, I was basically having none of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which which film was it? We even, was it the second Attack one the clones, they showed yeah. us the rough cut of? The and the, you know, like, I can't remember. The reason it kind of ended up being formulated around like Boba Fett was basically because you know, they, the product that they had was, was the Django Fett Slave One, and so mm. we wanted something that revolved around the Django Slave One, but I, I was just having none of it, and I was yeah. distant. But like, <laughs> the thing that people care about is classic Star Wars, yeah. and that's what I see. Yeah. So we just straight up, you know, digitally coloured in their toy <laughs> grid, <laughs> not yeah. the grid that they were trying to advertise. That's great. <laughs> yeah. But they did. They they took us. We went to like the Lego offices 
uh, and they had they had like a VHS of uh, rough cut of was it the second of the new ones? I can't yeah. remember because yeah. we'd already seen and yeah. sort of got over the first <laughs> seeing the first <laughs> one when it actually came. <laughs> but um, yeah, and they like they had like it was like guarded. They had like someone from Lucasfilm there to make sure we didn't go off with it, and we sat and watched it, and it was like the rough cut with like loads of footage from Judge Dredd and like footage of the effects crew like climbing on a car or something and pretending to be on a speeder thing and it was yeah it was, mu- it was much better than the actual film <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we basically decided it yeah we just wanted to do the real real yeah. Star Wars it's interesting to me that it seems like uh, maybe it's just because of how insistent you were but it seems like you had a lot of creative freedom with your, the projects that you made for Lego because you know in the years mm. since they started hiring people again uh, mm. the, who made many many videos for them but mm. oftentimes Lego would write the videos or they would provide the entire audio track and the people would just do the animation yeah. but with your yeah. stuff your stuff r- remains like your own like you, you even you have credits on your, your brick films mm. yeah, I, mean, I don't think we knew we were born I mean we yeah. at the time and obviously we were perhaps <laughs> doing the Spider-Man one but basically you know compared to any kind of client scenario I've been in in the 20 years since like yeah we didn't know we were born mm. in like yeah. credits on things and and just straight up deciding that no we're not doing that we're doing this other thing I think it was just a kind of we just had like the, the luck of a kind of naivety from people we were working with that they like barely knew what stop motion was or like why they're why they're asking for one they just knew that like the previous one was mm. fairly successful and so they're going to give us slightly more money to make another one this time yeah. and yeah we were we were pretty blessed yeah that's respect in terms of like what we're able to get away with and just insist on making yeah yeah we just kind of idealistically insisted that we put our credits on it and all this kind of thing and partly just because otherwise i mean we just we were doing it and we did it so you know lego would have never thought about whether or not a video has credits on it or whatever and we were like this is a film so it has credits so we just did it and i think it wasn't even a debate or anything Mm -hmm. i think they were just like okay that's what's happening i was always I've always been a bit pissed off at Monty Python and the Holy Grail in Lego. It's just called Monty Python and the Holy Grail in Lego. Mm. And so from that point, I, I was like very insistent on like, you know, coming up with the Han Solo affair as an yeah. actual title. Yeah, an actual name. A yeah. real title, yeah. The Earl of Dark Ark as an actual mm. title. But yeah, I, was al- I guess I was always wondering if it was something like, did you have to actually get it written into a contract or something that you would actually get credited because nowadays nobody gets credited it annoys us all mm. the time because we want to know who makes the animations for yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah absolutely we did we, we got it written in I, I, don't, I don't really know how we did that yeah i think we just said uh i think we just like i say i think because they weren't in the business of making films and there was no established this is how you put content on online or whatever they were just like there it was not their job to make films so we just decided how it was going to happen we were sort of blessed to be working in like most most of our films for them were made in like the three years where lego were actually losing money oh yeah yeah that's true oh, yeah there was, the, there was a big thing of like they were actually like you know facing bankruptcy mm. so and so our our films our experiments were like big experiments for them as well in terms mm. of like just kind of trying things outside the box. Yeah. And there's there's no way, you know, that we like get to do that now. If this if you know, if Lego came to us now and uh, you know, asked for a spite your face thing, you know, but well, they wouldn't even ask for a spite your face thing and they wouldn't get a spite your face thing. Mm-hmm. They would say just get some like prescribed website content that is kind of anonymous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that seems to be like the thing that they go for. I, you know, that's what I see like other people producing when they when they get to produce something for Lego. Yeah, mm. yeah. Nowadays, it, the stuff that people get to make for Lego, that stop motion, it is more like advertising rather than short films that you were making. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you were quite lucky, mm. I guess, in that regard. Yeah. yeah, I think that's interesting. Yeah, 
you you, you kind of uh, you know were there for a time where they were kind of just willing to try all sorts of different things and mm. kind of uh, were allowed you know were willing to give you quite a lot of freedom in terms of <laughs> what you wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we were just kind of you know no one was paying that much attention to us basically. Mm-hmm. I think I think like Lego were just like in a in a lot of trouble and trying to figure some stuff out, and so we were just kind of like, I think we just got away with a lot of things by this kind of combination of n- nobody really paying attention to us, but then us coming out with like an obviously very good product that everybody was like very happy and excited with when they saw it. Yeah. So they go, oh, okay, fine. Have your credits, have your whatever. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, as far as I know, is it correct that you were already in talks with Lego before the Python project had come along? I think so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, what what were we talking about first? Because, yeah, it was like... Well, they they basically like... (laughs) It's about the Lego Studio stuff, I guess, yeah. It basically was that the, the, like Lego just did the usual thing of like they tried to shut down one of Space Odyssey just because it was like a thing that existed they hadn't given permission for like no more thinking than that and we kind of actively kicked back against that and said you're being actively stupid this is good for you <laughs> and a particular person like Adriana who was kind of our uh, saving grace and was like the, the producer on most of our stuff on the Lego side. She just like, she called me up. I, rem- I remember the phone call. She was like, the phone call was she was going through like a series of mountain tunnels in Spain or somewhere. And she said, I'm, I'm going into a tunnel just very quickly. Is this what you do? And I just said, yes. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of how that whole like arrangement started. She said, "Is this what you do in in, in, in relation to, you know, describing one of space odyssey basically?" And I just said, "Yes." <laughs> and I just got invited in to come and talk about making like a Python film, I guess. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's people who've worked with Lego uh, have complained to me before that the different departments of Lego don't know what the other one is doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's like one side is threatening to sue you while the other side is trying to hire you, I guess. Yeah. Very <laughs> complicated. So they're also a company who are like basically completely impossible to like talk to the same person twice. Mm-hmm. Like somebody calls you, like I've been called up by. Lego about projects over the years and like the person who calls you up is just like not in the same position literally five days later <laughs> but yeah I actually you mentioned uh, Adriana uh, she actually helped me with my Lego Studios video <laughs> yeah I was I was asking around uh, mm. trying to find out who made the the original Lego Studios animations like the Dino Cup and the ones that were on the oh, original yeah. Studio CD, and of course those predate One of Space Odyssey. So I knew they couldn't yeah. have been made by you. But basically, everyone I asked, they they'd come back and say, "Are you sure it wasn't Spite Your Face?" <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, "Yeah, I'm sure." I think that I think those guys are actually like pretty pissed off that everyone thinks that. Yeah, but... I seem to remember finding like a, a record of like those guys kind of putting all their stuff like out on a website because they sort of wanted it to be known that they'd made that stuff and then mm. not us. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, 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 they certainly didn't do a very good job of making making themselves known because it took the community 20 years to find out who made those videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, I guess um, maybe you wouldn't know this, but do you think, did LEGO Studios like play a big part in LEGO's interest in having official stop motion made for them? And um, agreeing to the Python project. I've always thought it was a bit strange that, you know, Monty Python people would come to them and say, hey, do you want to collab on, I on mean, this video? I mean, yeah, that, that was definitely a thing. Because the, yeah. the thing that they got us involved in officially when they called us in was to get involved in the, uh, you know, the Lego Studios thing, mm. which was in its, like, second year or second yeah. generation at that point. Yeah. And so, but you know, they're interested in doing this like early failed 
weird Spider-Man stuff to kind of supersede Dino Cop or whatever. And that's like the thing we were ostensibly called in on. But they just had this Monty Python thing going on in the background at the same time. Mm. And, and so that ended up being the thing that we made first. Mm-hmm. It's a much better thing. So we're, yeah. We're yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just I, I found it kind of surprising that they'd agree to the Python project because like it's not a a kid friendly film and especially no. back then they weren't doing any sets we, for adults. We were the anything. only person. We were the only people who had like any sense of responsibility about that. Yeah. They kept they kept they kept saying like oh we should do like you know the Black Knights and it's like you are not doing Black Knights. <laughs> and this is a time when you know when we went there to talk to them they were they were you know those people working there were like complaining that you know they wanted to do batman lego but like the head of lego said batman's too violent and we're mm. never going to do batman lego and yeah that, that was a weird and that was the level that was that's what was going on at that time and then yeah, yeah then they wanted to make like multi python it's pretty strange but we when, when we went to like you know the, the you know the design studios and got all like you know in Berlin they've got all like the the lego we needed to make python film yeah, there was this weird thing going on where, like, whichever Christian some guy was, like, coming down, making a big sort of tirade about how they'll I'll never produce Batman Lego because it's too violent. And, and but, it, but it kind of extended, and that, that, that kind of had this, like, massive knock-on effect. Like, there was a whole toy range that they were working on that was basically an Injago. And you know, mm. that kind of just got knocked on the head. But, mm. You know, yeah. This is back in like two thousand two or whenever. I don't you know, know how, how long did it last that in the UK they thought like ninjas were you, you couldn't show ninjas in kids programs. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. That, that's like that's like a weird sort of seventies mm. phenomenon. That, yeah, and you had um, Bruce Lee holding a baguette on the first day. <laughs> some weird isolated incident of like a, you know a kid hitting another kid with some nunchucks or something in it yeah and it just sort of had this massive cultural effect of silly things like stuff then called you know hero turtles yeah and that. but i remember reading about uh when somebody came up with the idea that they should do star wars lego officially and like you know, the the higher up said, "Oh, we could never do that because it has war in the name, and yeah. we don't yeah. do war Lego." But mm. then eventually they got persuaded, and that was like basically what saved them from bankruptcy. I think. Like a, a Star Wars is not technically a war, so it's okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of strange. I guess they realized that Star Wars results in them getting huge amounts of money. Yeah, it sounds like there was just one person who was insistent that it was yeah a golden ticket. Mm. It is interesting, yeah, how, like, you know, Star Wars has basically sort of remains, like, probably one of the most sort of, like, uh, popular properties within, you know, like, sort of Lego, really. Mm. I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that Perla Doc Ock, yeah, you had difficulties getting paid for that one. So mm. I guess, does that mean that there was never any talk afterwards? Like, there was never any ideas for projects after that with Lego? Yeah, no, I mean, we just weren't in the financial position to continue as a business, so we just... That just kind of shut everything down, which which put 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 me, put me in this like really weird position where like cause I got I got employed um, quite quickly down in London by like just this like sort of slightly hokey um, DVD distribution company. Uh, so there's this point about three months after we'd done Duck Off where I was like producing just advertising to go in this magazine called Kid Screen, which is like the main kind of industry publication for like, you know, broadcast children's cartooning. And I was like, you know, Spotty Photo Hour was, was being listed in the current issue of that magazine as like one to watch the up and coming guy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's like, it's like bitch, yeah. you're like, <laughs> no advertising, you know. Mm. That's what that's what's really going on here. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, it, it's always been mysterious to me. Like the part of Doc Ock is so good and it was so successful. Mm-hmm. I always wondered why why wasn't there any more? Mainstream advertising really like was kind of blown away by the concept of Spite Your Face mm-hmm. for a couple of months because it's generally known like if you're if you're like at like you know McCann Ericsson or any of these other kind of big advertising companies, it's kind of known that like Lego are, are like the are like the impossible whale to catch. Hmm. Oh yeah, but, 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 but historically they always just do their own advertising, and so all these kind of big companies like M M&M, and M C Saatchi and whatever, you know, they've been trying to like bag uh, Lego for like decades and failing. And then these like upstarts, like they sort of come out of nowhere and have like yeah. produced mm-hmm. a bunch of like video advertising for, for Lego and gotten credited on it. And, yeah, like, <laughs> it just kind of blew everybody's mind. And like, so so like the, the, con- the conventional advertising world was just like kind of going crazy about who even are these guys? How have they achieved this thing? But we'd already just like just moved on and gone yeah basically. <laughs> yeah we kind of it was a bit like we didn't want to just be typecasters only doing lego as well and uh we and and we get a thing where you know people would see it and be like this is amazing can we get you to do like a lego version of this that and the other and we we're like no because it's lego making these and you know yeah we can't just make some other lego films for someone else using yeah. lego because we can't do that you know it's their thing mm-hmm. So it was kind of it was a bit of a difficult position sometimes for that because, yeah, people wanted that stuff, but obviously not not everyone would can deal with Lego and get a Lego thing made and be allowed to do it. So but there's a yeah. lot of things we kind of had to basically turn down because of that. And also, yeah. nobody ever wants to, wants to pay for it. And yeah, they want it because it's stop motion. They think it's yeah. oh, it looks hand yeah. it looks kind of handmade. It must be it's toys. It must be cheap to make, but <laughs> it's like the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess it, it that might have changed somewhat recently. Mm. I mean, I think over the years, people might have, there's more awareness of how long stop motion takes because yeah. there's a lot of people in the community who nowadays, you know, they, they get a lot of random clients, mostly mm. not the Lego group themselves, but mm. they, they, they charge pretty good rates like yeah, yeah. Per, per minute of stop motion and, and they get work. So mm. that's good. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I have, a, I found it interesting that like, I guess, is, this is probably because you had started before there even was a community or anything. But I think it's interesting that you had the idea that you could um, like upload videos to the internet and, and submit them to film festivals and stuff and maybe actually make money with Lego animation. Because yeah. like, you were the first ones to, to think of doing that. Anyone anyone getting paid for it before you were like already, you know, production companies. Yeah. So like, yeah, I, I guess... How how did you did, did you have your eyes on the Lego group like from from the beginning? Did you think that was going to be your only potential client? No, not not in the slightest. It hmm. was a completely random thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, when we made the Lego films, you know, we were just like being animators, and you know, we had in mind to do whatever other other kinds of animation. For All that we had, as, as I recall it, was just a sort of like like a holiday animation. Like we were hmm. just. We were just like being really stressed out by our like degree films at the time, and so we just made this like crazy straight ahead Super 8 sort of horror film in like two evenings or something. Mm. And it was absolutely just about like you know, just trying to sort of have fun with animation and relax, Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, um, one of Space Odyssey was kind of the same thing. On a space odyssey would, would have come just after both of our degree films and was just about you know, being kind of this like respite thing. But I don't think I don't think we had any aspirations for it to be like, oh we're just gonna keep doing this and No. And it yeah, it wasn't like we wanted to work for Lego or wanted to do commercials or whatever. Anyway, we just kind of it just happened, yeah. Yeah, but obviously it was you were you know it was amazing that it did, but we, it wasn't something we set out to. Yeah, we totally achieve. fell into it. I was just kind of basing that off because um, I'd found an archive of an old post you'd written on the brickfilms.com mm. forum in early two thousand and one, 
that and where you're basically warning the community like <laughs> if you have any aspirations forget about it yeah. <laughs> we were we were thinking of trying to make you know make money with lego animation but it's not not going to happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah because at that time it was more that yeah we were having all this problems of worrying about copyright and yeah, yeah. but i mean yeah that would have been when the lego group were, were mm. telling you you're not yeah. allowed to do anything at all yeah, yeah. So that, it was always a great mystery to me. Like, how did you go from yeah being completely shut down to then suddenly you're you're working for Lego? Yeah, it's strange. Well, like I say, I think it's just that like Adriana saw the stuff and said, "Is this what you do?" And then I said, "Yes." That, that was basically mm-hmm. the process. Mm-hmm. It, like, it got in front of somebody who you know wasn't a silly lawyer, <laughs> and 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 that person just. I saw a potential that this is something that we should actively be doing rather than trying to shut down or whatever. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so the shut down people got shut down. <laughs> yeah. And actually, um, what is the story behind the name Spite Your Face? Why did you settle on that? Um, well, it basically came like it, it, it was a thing that, that is like video, very idiosyncratic at the time that we just got our friend Keith to kind of write a bunch of potential names of production companies. And I think we had this kind of general idea that like production companies in general just seem to have like really random silly names, you know, mm-hmm. like that robot or whatever, you know, they're just production companies have. We're really into like, yeah, the names you'd see on anime credit sequences where it's like Studio Potato or whatever, <laughs> just some completely random nonsense word and yeah Keith wrote this amazing list of just you know we're just like cracking up reading these ridiculous names and I think that was the most ridiculous and inconvenient to use so we chose it. Spite your face stuck to me because it was like and still makes sense to me because it really is for like you know go, going out of your way to like do something stupid on principle where we, you come off the worst is yeah kind of our entire history you know <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah all, all, all this kind of chasing goals of like trying to go beyond the remit of the thing you've actually been asked for to do something you know more complex so that mm. for like your own stupid purposes is kind of classic spite your face yeah. move. I know you recently commented that it's amusing that the last piece of Lego stop motion you did was a Brick films were a mistake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that caps it off perfectly. <laughs> I think that's, yeah. But then at some point, uh, I, I have these vague memories of seeing some like Lego robot animations. Uh, were you working on something in like 07, maybe? That never got released? Oh, was the Tron stuff. Oh, God, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, I still got that. I should just. Yeah, and I, I forgot about yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah, there was this, this project called Tron. It's like a combination of Tron and Wrong. It was like, yeah, probably about 07. We were, we were kind of like dabbling around with that idea. Mm. I think, you know, it was just that kind of a time. It was a, everything was a bit sort of synth wave. We were just toying with the idea of like, if you, make a bunch of stop motion that you know is sort of reverse filtered in, in, the, in the original Tron kind of capacity but it would allow you to make like a whole film that was just like you know on a green screen or you know otherwise not, not really requiring of making elaborate sets which we didn't feel we had the capacity to do at the time so yeah but it just kind of, we just kind of got bored, basically. Yeah, I think. So we had, that, like, we, yeah, we had some access to a studio to try it out, and then we, yeah, we shot some stuff. We shot some stuff. Never, never finished anything. There's a few random shots of like you know, uh, quite elaborate motorcycle chase. Um, but yeah, basically, we just got bored and stopped. They look cool. There's, yeah, I have to dig them out and just. And, I mean, I've got better glowing technologies than they had in those days so i can stick them in after effects and do smooth them maybe or at least mm. just put them online somewhere yeah we, we had this 
saw a spider robot thing walking around and uh, yeah that was about it really yeah i i remember seeing the spider robot somewhere i, think, I can't yeah, remember I where i saw it we posted some preview we probably put at least like some screenshots of it on somewhere or... can't remember <laughs> but, but if you do have any old footage that could be dug up that would be very very exciting to a, a small number of us <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll see if i can find it yeah i mean i'll, I'll leave that to tim just yeah I, I do have it all i'm pretty sure i have all of it i've even got the raw files i've found recently so i just figure out what there even was and how to make it look remotely like anything in particular that's very exciting. I did, yeah, I remember trying to like start doing the After Effects years ago, but the thing with After Effects is that I've been trying to revisit old projects and um, it isn't backwards compatible. You know, mm. if you go far back enough in time, it's not actually even possible to open any of these things anymore. Okay. So I could just have to go back to the original footage and just see what I can do. Yeah. But I don't think I did much anyway, so yeah. Would that have been the last Lego stop motion that the two of you would have worked on together? Uh, yeah. Yeah, probably that was yeah that was the last thing we did together. The only thing really subsequent to that, which is many years later, is that that weird explainers thing, which I did on my own. Oh yeah, yeah, I didn't work on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, there was also a couple of Lego figures in a happy street. Oh yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. But again, yeah. was I? Yeah, I didn't work on it, did I? No. No, only I worked on happy yeah, street. That was it. Because the story of Happy Street is that that was uh, a piece that was it was for the BBC ostensibly, um, and it was supposed to be like this, like I think it was like a two day shoot, th three animators, two days, and the whole thing was on like a motion control rig. But for like inter internal politics reasons. The, the the BBC basically cancelled the entire project on the day that we were due to start filming. So I was I was put in this position where it's like, okay, well we can't afford like everything's set up. It's a simple if if we want to actually if we actually want to like run this and like anim you know run the 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 motion control we can go through it and it's a simple question of turning the button on. But we can't afford any any other animators. We can't afford to pay anybody else. So I just kind of went at it heroically and did hmm. what was supposed to be a two day shoot with three animators on my own in one mm. day. Wow! <laughs> with like no with like no sys rig because that, because we could turn on the motion control rig. And there was nobody nobody <laughs> couldn't afford to employ anybody to like watch the motion control rig. <laughs> so there is no there is no vid sys to any of it in it and it's just like completely straight ahead animation same as same as like uh, on the dead or something <laughs> pretty interesting yeah. I, I, a funny thing i i found interesting about um happy street was that uh it kind of just sort of ends very abruptly as well <laughs> yeah i mean that's the thing yeah, like because it's just like there's no there's, there is just no room to perfect timing or anything like that i'm literally just like going ahead animating straight forward trying to like keep the characters w within the frame like in the f in the same physical place as the motion control camera that is just like mercilessly moving forward like a mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, I guess I never really thought about it before because I was just enjoying seeing animation, sightseeing for Lego figures in yeah. particular. But I, I never thought about what is it actually advertising? <laughs> yeah, I think it was just supposed to be something like some sort of weekend of BBC programming about childhood or something like this. Oh, OK. Mm. If you, you say the BBC cancelled the project, so was it never actually used as advertising? Yeah, it was never used. It was... It is a sim it is a sim it's one of these things that happens like surprisingly often where like person A had commissioned a thing and and you know and brought that commission all the way forward to the point where it's basically about to be made and then person B who was higher up than then came back from holiday and went, What is this bullshit? <laughs> 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 Funny, I was I was trying to work out like if it was yeah if it was like based on like you know TV like you know things on BBC or something because like it it looks like there's a guy that's like bald figure I don't know if that was supposed to be like Was Kemp or something 
Well, it's just generally there's there's some sort of theme running for it of like, you know, childhood, but like augmented through reality. So there's all this mm-hmm. kind of like druggy kids at a, at a bus stop and there's police stuff going on in an alleyway. But it was just literally, it was literally just this like incredibly arduous job of like making sure that the particular things that are in front of the camera are moving when the camera is in front of them and, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. like all, all those little like weird wooden scrog kids that kind of chase throughout, you know, making sure that they like keep up with the camera and then they sort of keep <laughs> up with the camera at the right time. But as I say, it was all just uh, just totally done without a, a vid this and it's supposed to be like three people working on it, coordinating all this stuff. Mm. I do really like it because it's like, uh, it, even if we don't really have, you know, if it wasn't actually used or anything, it has this kind of like interesting kind of story where it's like, it starts off as really kind of like colourful and sort of uh, almost like nostalgic, very, you know, sort of nice kind of sort of thing. And then it goes into more like dark and gritty. And <laughs> But uh, you mentioned using a motion control rig. Uh, did you also use a motion control rig for the Cocoa Pops ad? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I, I remember seeing that on TV when it aired, and I had no idea that it was Spite Your Face production. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when I found that out later, I thought that was amazing. Because I was always amazed by that ad, and I kind of still have no idea how it was done. Like, mm-hmm. how how are the Cocoa Pops? Is that all stop motion? Oh, God, it's like literally every technique under the sun. Like, that, that's like a that's like, um, real me kind of thing of, like, again, following, like, Evil Dead logic. Of just just making sure that we use like every possible technique at least once. So like the cocoa pops when they when they exit the box, there's literally like sort of sixty tons of cocoa pops being like pushed through a kind of bazooka <laughs> that sticks out wall <laughs> like about twenty foot. Because if you, what, you know, what actually happens if you like flip over and eject like a, a, a box of cocoa pops worth of cocoa pop is it just makes this kind of like really pathetic little splash that doesn't look like the amount of cereal that would be in a box in order to produce the, what looks like the amount of cereal that is in a box. You have to use about 40 times as much cereal. Yeah. box so like it goes from this like sort of live action thing that just just shoots out a huge sort of torrent of like cocoa pops and just splashes all over the table but then like match cuts to like a, to like a cgi one that, that like, does the, la- the sort of landing on the surface and bouncing Mm-hmm. So it's like you know, it's this, it's this like match cut from like live action to CGI, and then like the CGI moves up to a certain point where it's like bouncing along the top of these like saucepans, and at that point it's actually two D. Yeah, those ones are okay. just drawn, aren't they? Those are the ones that are literally just drawn because we like the the conceit was that. They sort of bounce along the top of the pan and they play like the famous little Cocoa Pops tune, which is just like sort of too fast a phenomenon to work in in any kind of like CGI formulation. So we just like 2D animated it. Mm-hmm. And, that, and then that goes from like transitions from the 2D animation to this like weird kind of, uh, I guess, replacement animation where it goes over the bridge like you know it for- formulates the shape of a bridge and and that travels out of a bridge over the top of uh a basin so that's all like replacement animation and then that goes into like i guess a sort of fairly traditional character stop motion piece mm-hmm. that is like again even that again this is another classic one of like Tim did one that was deemed too evil, so we had to do it. Yeah. So, so <laughs> there's a Tim Drage cut of that love bouncing around. Uh-huh. It's like 
deems to be too evil. It's too frightening. I remember when I was animating at some point, I just, I just got, you know, when you're animating, you sort of go a bit weird sometimes. And uh, I just, I, there was something about the way it's like fingers crossed over and it was running along. When I watched the preview, I was just like in hysterics for like two minutes and couldn't continue. <laughs> just like. Yeah. Yeah, I figured the glove part had to be stop motion. Yeah. Right. So when it goes across as a bridge, like th those are actually physical models. Like the yeah, those are basically physical models that are kind of cardboard covered in cocoa pops on the outside. Mm. Yeah, it was just like yeah, just someone sat there gluing loads of cocoa pops. I I don't think I've eaten cocoa pops since we made that. I literally they're just <laughs> having to be like in a hot studio full of them for that amount of time. <laughs> It's just permanently put me off. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty gross environment. Yeah. So then I guess when it goes into the fan, that that must be back to CG. And then that's like back to CG. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Although there's a, there's always sort of funny little details like it's when it goes into the fan, it's like it's back to CG. But I thought it was sort of really important to have certain individual pops be like. Sort of captured on camera, so they were there's like there's just like straight up some cocoa pops like glued to the fan, yeah. So you can sort of see them through the like like there's a, there's a remote, the majority of them like disappear off and do their CG thing, but the, you know the fan is like a live action fan and it just has a couple of cocoa pops like glued to it. Yeah. <laughs> This is all all very fascinating to me because I've always wondered about this this mm. particular ad for many years. <laughs> you did actually do uh, a couple of years ago on your Instagram. You have like a couple of uh, VFX sort of breakdowns of the uh, of the commercial, don't you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. There's. I yeah. Have missed those. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I put a couple of things on my Instagram or somewhere. Yeah, there's a few breakdowns because like I'm pretty proud of like just how many like. Different things went into that advert. Yeah. Although the advert is just like, you know, I, I think that the basic concept of it is like really gross and like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like, like the, the clients were just like insane. People. I don't know what they thought they were thinking, but I just went with it. And mm. so like, if it's how you want, if this is what you want, if you really think you want to show like Tokyo <laughs> kind of trawling your proper kitchen. And, yeah, go, go inside a glove. I mean, we were just yeah, yeah, we were just happy to sort of subvert that and have some weird Spank my esque sort of. Uh, it's like, how do they... you how do you make it impressive enough? You know, to to well people and distract people from how like gross it actually is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. I, I really, I really find it funny that you would invoke Spank Meyer in a Cocoa Pops commercial. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's one of the things we were just happy to be able to get away with this kind of weirdness. Yeah. That, that's exactly the sort of stuff that yeah as i was saying like in the brickfinning community now we'd be kind of telling people to check out like yeah old old stop motion animation outside of brick filming yeah. yeah i I'd recommend people look up dimensions of dialogue mm. by jan spankmeyer you can find it on youtube yeah really good short film yeah <laughs> and yeah i think that's, that's probably a good starting point yeah yeah i think so <laughs> Dimensions of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dimensions of Coco. You know, what that film pretty much is. It's just so weird. <laughs> Such a weird thing to have made. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's, that's what we wanted. Sometimes yeah. you just think the client just, like, has their idea and that's, that's what they want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something that I, I was just, just kind of, like, going to ask, actually, then... Uh, are there like other like um, particularly like really memorable uh, kind of client sort of films outside like Lego and stuff that you kind of like come to mind when you you know throughout your sort of career? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of uh, any of that. I mean, I I think like if if you go through like you know the Spot Your Face YouTube channel and just like look at the things that we've uploaded. It's like, it, it, particularly once you get into like, you know, that period, just like doing like commercial kind of freelancing stuff. It really does become about like the client always wants content, but you as, as, you know, somebody trying to build a showreel always want to be making like 
a film that stands on its own in the way that the, the Lego stuff stands on its own. And so I think like the stuff that I like, the stuff that's sort of best is, is the stuff that's like that where, you know, they've, they've just asked for some content, but we've kind of pushed it to mm. actually be like a short film. There's, there's a few things, there's a few things I uploaded very recently, like that film called a, a, a song of fire and safety. Oh yeah. It's just like a, it's like a little simple, you know, I think it sort of stands up beyond being its content thing. Mm. Uh, there's a film I just uploaded that is like something that was made for some weird podcast or other, but has this very serious sort of theme to it about uh, ecology and that like a very politicized reading of like ecology. I had to put a lot of work into keeping the message on message. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, like the client wanted like much more saturated version of that. I don't think they, don't think they literally understood like, how, like the, the, the dialogue all comes from like the, this couple of activists and, and the things that they're saying. I don't think like the client literally understood like half of the arguments that that was actually it's fake, but I did yeah. understand the arguments and, and the, the job of making sure those arguments carried through and that it is actually as radical a piece as it is, <laughs> it is <laughs> was, you know, a lot of work. Mm. Yeah, I did see that one and yeah, I, it was pretty, yeah, as you say, radical as far as being a like mm. a advertising piece. But yeah. yeah. Most of my like client stories are, well, either really boring or too weird or not okay to tell the world about. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I ha- I found it kind of funny that like you have this sort of interest in underground art or perhaps even an anti-establishment bent, but then mm. you'd be like the first people to take brick filming from a, a hobbyist thing to a you know a commercial yeah <laughs> venture. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our influences were, you know, it, yeah, we weren't trying to get into the advertising world. We were trying to just, you know, we're influenced by like a lot of sort of, you know, film like filmmakers like Sam Rami and uh, Tsukamoto and Svangma who just like wanted to make their own weird thing. And we were massively were inspired by uh, Mike Jitlov, The Wizard of Speed and Time, his film. We used to watch quite obsessively, and um, yeah, he was all. Yeah, that was basic. I mean, the film is about his him trying to get films made, and uh, yeah, that kind of thing. That's kind of what we were going for, and we had we sort of filtered that through whatever project we did, even though it was kind of in opposition to that at some level. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like you were approaching it from a very different perspective, um, different place than like everyone else who started at the same time that you did. Yeah, had different different influences. Mm. It's just, it's just that, like I say, it's that thing of like, as an, as an individual, you just want to be able to, whatever nonsense you end up, you know, making for, to pay the bills, you, you want the outcome to be something that, you know, you can show to people and, and like stands on its own as, as a piece of filmmaking. And that's, always yeah that's always been this thing that wasn't really sort of understood by the early brick film stuff and yeah because i mean even like on brickfilms.com when it started like in 2001 there were a lot of people who were of similar age to you or even older uh at the time Mm. and but their stuff looked a lot more amateur than than yours did i mean that's what was really difficult for me at the time it's like it's it's a different thing for me to like Go, you know, go and look on YouTube and just see that there's like, you know, a million lightsaber duels and understand mm-hmm. that those million lightsaber duels are all just made by like some random kid that's just <laughs> starting out for the first time and just wants to try like, you know, mm. lightsaber duel is generally like the most accessible kind of easy, like, you know, low cost, high yield kind of thing. But, it's really difficult for me to accept that level of 
I don't know, like amateurism, I guess, from like guys I knew were like older than me, and yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it was really difficult to kind of take him seriously and not not feel sort of antagonised, really, because a lot of what they were doing, creating this, this kind of like cultural content, was just seemed like really antithetical to the goals of what we were doing, and it's like. And in a way, made it sort of more, more, more difficult. I always felt it's like if you guys actually like uh, so inspired by us and like copied us more and made more films that are like what we're making, like that would actually create a bigger market for us to do what we do, and there would probably be more spite your face films in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like back then in oh one and oh two. There was really only one other person pushing the filmmaking qualities of Rick filming on a similar level as you. That was Jay Silver. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you are aware of Jay's Rick film. It's, it's the gauntlet of his. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's Rise of the Empire. Exactly it, really. You know, the fact that, that the sort of history of that film that he was you know, a week late for the competition it was ostensibly for and you know, why, why was he a week late? Because he was, because he was asking the questions. Mm. He was asking the questions that everybody else should be asking, which, mm-hmm. but why? Who is this for? <laughs> what is this for? What, what, you know, what, what is the, what is the buy-in for somebody else looking at this film? And he like fundamentally like addressed those questions by going and, you know, putting, putting the, character at eye level and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah i i I guess i feel like a a lot of the rest of us realized a lot of these things too late (laughs) so you know now we we only have the time to make like a good brick film once a year or once every two years (laughs) other than that we just sit around and watch films that other people have made and, and try and tell people hey you should think about this you should think about that but we we barely barely pr- have the time to practice it ourselves, which is unfortunate. Mm. Yeah, that is that is kind of uh, one of the uh, one of the kind of things you realise as, as you kind of get older is the you know that um, the better you get, the the less you're able to actually make things, and <laughs> and also the harder yeah. it is to enjoy. I mean, I know this is going to sound really bad, but like the harder it is to watch a lot of what other people are making, because like mm. yeah. Once you know too many things, then then things start to seem kind of basic. So I I I understand where you're coming from by saying that like you you couldn't really engage with the the community in that time period. Mm. So I'm guessing you didn't really watch a lot of the brick films that were um, like coming out at the same time as yours. Yeah, basically yeah. we watched a few, but yeah, it wasn't like um, and also I mean I don't retain the knowledge of. What I thought. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, I mean, it wasn't as easy to even watch things. I mean, I remember. Yeah. Um, I remember when we put our first uh, film on our own site. You know, um, I think there was one or two other, ostensibly one or two other brick films online. There was uh, Salt Lake Spaceport and something else. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, we were literally at the university computer lab trying to watch these in on like real media, and it just literally wouldn't load or whatever. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. like I, know, I still haven't ever seen that, even though at the time we were like, oh wow, there's another brick film out there. <laughs> well, I-, I did manage to track that one down a couple of years ago, so oh, cool. <laughs> it is it's available now if you want to tie up that loose end. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I do yeah. remember. Um, yeah, desperately trying to download brick films mm. uh, a couple of times before YouTube, and yeah, I might have been able to watch two downloaded from the internet. Yeah. That was about it. I mean, we um, the other file types didn't work. One of the other early spotty face dramas was that was it? I can't remember. It was the which of the films it was. But yeah, the, I guess it was all of the dead. We um, we put it on our you know we just put it on our website as a quick time movie that you could download because there was not even any way to embed it somewhere to stream or whatever in those days and um we had a supposedly unlimited hits package on our serv- on our web service provider uh but then you know it yeah like you said it was like one of the first viral videos so it you know we got just thousands and billions of hits and um they completely crashed their server and they would 
they basically tried to charge us like thousands of pounds <laughs> and we had to like we had to take them to small claims court in the end and actually got it got it back basically but, yeah um, basically like because as far as we were concerned it was like unlimited but yeah we had we did have like provable record that our package of fish we had like unlimited estimates mm. Instead, yeah, we were able to we basically settle out of court. Yeah, we were right. But that was quite an interesting experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't imagine that these days. No, no, and it was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it was. I don't know how much space we even had. It was like a few megabytes or something. It was like this big deal. <laughs> and yeah, no, that's no, not really a problem. But yeah, like I said, um. Yeah, there's a lot of early big film stuff that I just never got around to seeing just because we couldn't even watch it or didn't, you know. Yeah. That's the thing as well. I mean, I imagine back then it was just harder to uh, get engaged in, in, you know, stuff that was being made because of, like, the investment of time in, mm. you know, downloading something and, like, I don't know, if you came across two brick films in, in a day, you know, and you kind of felt like, oh, yeah, yeah didn't like either of these, it's not going to really <laughs> entice you to be like, oh, yeah, I've got to, you know, try again. <laughs> <laughs> on the flip side, it, it always seems like people, you know, people on the forum back then would write these super long, super detailed reviews. I always oh, got yeah. the impression that they were more invested because they actually had to uh, spend time yeah. waiting for the download. <laughs> That's yeah, true. Actually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had to put more effort into actually watch it. Whereas nowadays you don't really, there's not much like, uh, other than a podcast like this, I guess, <laughs> you know, people don't really talk about brick films in very, very lengthy <laughs> reviews and statements and whatnot. No. It's just sort of nice. I've got to watch the next one now. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, is it around the time that we should probably sort of start wrapping up? Yeah, I can do. Um... Yeah, I guess so. If you've run out of like, you could have your cheese questions. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of these kind of things where like, uh, we say this a lot of the do podcast, have to, but... We always have to stop ourselves, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because we could just keep going and keep going. But uh, mm. no, no, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you both uh, uh, to basically join us it was uh yeah yeah just really like uh kind of surreal because like you know we, we've been yeah. <laughs> talking about your films pretty much from the start uh you know throughout mm. this podcast you know, like, you know the four years that we've been doing this podcast so yeah thank you so much for for joining us guys yeah thank you it's been good so, sorry yeah, been, uh... i hate your film so much <laughs> 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 no i i think um Perhaps harsh but fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks so much. I agree. It's it's surreal seeing your names in the call here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it's great to finally talk with you on the podcast. Thanks. I'm one of the f one of the few uh, you know episodes where the guest doesn't uh, cite spot your face as a inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I kind of did. <laughs> I was kind of like, yeah, we inspired each other. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> we finally got it. Got it for the podcast. Bingo! Spite your face influence. Yeah. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Right. See you later, guys. Bye. <laughs>